Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November 21st, 2024 Northampton City Council meeting. Uh, I'm Alex Jarrett as City Council President. I'll be presiding this evening. Uh, Councilor Vice President Mayori is absent. This meeting and all participating in person and on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. And the meeting can also be watched on Comcast Channel 15 or by streaming on Northampton Open Media's YouTube channel. Um, and now call the City Council to order. Could you take the roll, please? Yeah. <coughs> oh, you're not. You I'm here. sorry. That yeah, I've heard. It. Councillor Dobbs? Here. Okay, Councillor Elkins? Here. Councillor Jarrett? Here. Councillor Clemmer? Here. Councillor Labarge? Present. Councillor Mayores? Not present. Um, okay. Um, Councillor Moulton. Here. Councillor Perry. Here. And Councillor Rothenberg. Here. Council President, you have a quorum. Thank you. So tonight's highlights include a presentation presentations from the mayor on the upcoming city hall closure and on her statement reaffirming Northampton's commitment to inclusion and safety. In order to appropriate money from the Special Education Stabilization Fund to the current Northampton Public Schools budget, uh, an ordinance to make a temporary stop sign permanent at Hatfield Street and Cook Ave, a resolution in second reading opposing the expansion of the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School, and an extension request for the Northampton Reparation Study Commission. We don't have any announcements of public hearings, so we are ready for public comment. So if you wish to make a public comment, you can sign up at the podium. Uh, or um, <clears throat> if you're on Zoom, you can use the raise hand feature. And the raise hand feature is in the bottom menu bar. Um, click on react and then raise hand. And if you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you are having trouble raising your virtual hand, you can turn on your video and physically raise your hand. If you want to submit a written public comment, you can email it to citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. It will be sent to all councilors and will be part of the public record. So I'm going to alternate between people in the room and people on Zoom. And before you begin, state your name and your city or town for the public record. Um, to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to speak, the council limits comments to a maximum of two minutes. After two minutes, we'll ask you to fin please finish your sentence. And if someone has already said something that you agree with, feel free to second their thoughts. Uh, that will allow more people to speak as we do have a total time of 90 minutes. According to the council rules, we do not respond during public comment as it is your time to speak. And our rules also state that counselors and members of the public shall conduct themselves with civility and respect at all times. Your protected speech is a constitutional right, one that we ask you to wield with consideration and respect for all, and with recognition that the public space that grants you that freedom is shared equally by everyone. You can speak on any topic. It doesn't need to be an item on the agenda. And all comments are to be directed to the council. Uh, we do have uh, council members with hearing accessibility concerns, so if you don't have the floor, uh, please use motions rather than sound while others are speaking. And we'll start in the room with Sarah Elkins. I know I've said your name, but if you could say your name and city or town, that would be great. Thank you. I am Sarah Elkins. I'm from 73 Barrett Street, Hathaway Farms. Apartments, uh, Ward 1. In the new Trump administration, in Plan 2025 and PBS News, there's serious talk about clawing back unspent federal grants given to cities and towns from the COVID funds, infrastructure funds, and Inflation Reduction Act funds that remain in general city funds and city rainy day funds past January 20th are vulnerable to this clawback. The city lawyer is unable to prevent this clawback because the new president has the legal right to change course on giving out grants at all. Since these federal grants need to be completely spent very quickly, what could be more important to our community's future than spending these funds to fully staff our public schools and our fire department? 
We show what we value by what we choose to fund fully. Let's be proud years from now that the city decided to fully fund our public schools and fire department. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to Zoom. Um, Winston Campbell, let me unmute you. Sorry. Oh, the hand was lowered. Uh, the next person would be Dan. It's back up. Oh, it's back up. Okay. Winston, uh, your name and city or town, please. Hi, I'm Winston Campbell. Um, I live in Northampton, um, 16 Sherman Ave. Um, I'm in the fifth grade at Bridge Street Elementary School. I'm here today to advocate for myself and my peers. Here's some inside information about how the school needs more money. Last year, I watched the budget meetings and learned Northampton Public Schools were underfunded by $2 million. Because of this, a lot of important job were cut, such as parents and office staff. If I was in charge of distribu distributing the budget, I would definitely hire back more parents and English teachers. I would like to share my perspective on the literacy situation. In my class, some people are only reading books with one sentence facts, such as the Guinness World Record books and graphic novels and books similar to that level. The reading level in my school is not consistent, and many kids are reading below grade level. When kids who speak other languages than English they join the school, they don't get help they need to learn English and participate in class. I'm currently 10 years old, and I've always been fascinated by law, finance, and government. Even as a five-year-old, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. I'm 500% sure that being a lawyer requires a good education. I um. I learned from council meeting last year that the high school is getting heavily affected by the budget cuts in addition to the elementary school and the middle school. I have an older brother in middle school whose favorite teacher nearly lost his job last year from the cuts. The weekly classes um, we take are called specials. These include library, PE, art, and music. These teachers need financial support as our teachers can barely afford to play. In music class, they get more money for instruments because then students can actually take turns on real musical instruments instead of boom markers, which are small floor xylophones for kids. I was in kindergarten when COVID struck. Some kids still haven't caught up. Miss Daniels, a fifth grade teacher, is a good teacher. She has gotten everyone um, in the class mostly caught up to where they need to be, but we still need more parents and teachers to support students who are still struggling. The upper grades at my school no longer have staff to do intervention for kids who are still catching up on schools. In conclusion, my school could be a lot better all we need is some more money to educate everyone to their full potential. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Al Simon. <clears throat> Hello again. Um, Al Simon, Northampton. I've got seven things I want to I want to say. First, I want to thank uh, the mayor and the city council for adding your voice to stop the charter school expansion that will cost our public schools even more money. Since you don't control that decision on expansion, you are attempting to inf influence the people who do. And welcome to the club, because that's what we're trying to do with you. Second, we want money from the soon to be certified free cash to be allocated in a mid-year appropriation to restore the school job cuts. We will be told we can't do that. Uh, there is no money because we have other plans for it. Our answer is change your plans and prioritize the schools. I will point out our neighbors in Amherst um, just rejected a transfer of free cash um, because they are listening to their residents who say their schools are underfunded. And that seems to be a developing story. We'll be told that this mid-year money will run out at the end of the current school year. We say that's right. And that's why we want the jobs funded in the next fiscal year as well. We'll be told there is no money to put in the budget next year. We say actually budget the revenue you get during the year for schools and take a smaller surplus. We'll be told a smaller surplus means we can't spend all we want on capital projects. We say change your future plans and priorities. The capital, the capital improvement plan is modified every single year. It changes all the time. In short, the harm from the mayor's unnecessary cuts to our public schools must be reversed. 
and then the city needs to start the long march of properly funding our schools. Public education is a priority. We want our city and all its elected officials to acknowledge that and to act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next on Zoom is Dan. Dan, your name and city or town, please. Hey everybody, I'm joining on mute, uh, or sorry, on Zoom, so I'm gonna have my, or my phone, so I'm gonna have my camera off. Um, my name is Dan Kennedy, I'm in Ward 4, uh, Ward 4B. Um, I don't really know how to follow what Al just said, that was really great, and it was pretty closely aligned with what I wanted to say, which is that one of the things that I've noticed, I don't think anyone in the council chamber, I don't think anyone in the city government actively wakes up in the morning and says, wow, I hate kids and I want to hurt them. Um, but I do think that one of the things that's happened is that we have also gotten complacent and gotten used to certain practices which, while we don't intend to have them be harmful, actually do have harmful consequences. Right? So you know, teachers have explained how bad things are, and it was pretty close to what they said would happen about a year ago when we started talking about not having level services. Uh, and it looks like, uh, when we look at the budget season again, that we're going to do the same thing, which is that we're going to follow the same processes that we use to get into this space to make similar or the same decisions. And so what I would like to do is challenge everyone in this room to collectively think about how to make things better. Not just what do we do, how do we do the same thing and expect a different result, but what do we do that is radically different so that we do not end up with the same problems that we're in now. So that's the challenge. I hope we all can work together to meet that. And uh, thank you all for all of the work that you are, that you're doing now. Thank you. Tim Putnam. Good evening. Tim Putnam from Northampton Firefighters Local 108. Uh, I'm up here tonight to speak on the surplus. Um, so at Northampton Fire, we're going to be hitting about pretty close to 10,000 calls this year. To give you some context, when I started 12 years ago, we were at about four to 5,000 calls. Uh, so average out 27 calls a day now versus about 15 would be a busy day when I first started. Uh, to combat that, I want to th actually thank the mayor for listening to the firefighters and uh, uh, starting a plan to add more staff. But the issue that we're running into with adding staff is our pay right now. Uh, there are many communities out there that are vying for the same individuals that are candidates, paramedics coming out of the paramedic school, which is a lot less than it was when I first started. Uh, and what's the draw to Northampton? How are we going to get the best qualified individuals into our city? And right now, if you look at other cities around us, comparable, uh, comparable contracts around us, there's not many highlights in our contract that would draw in an individual, a motivated individual to come into work for our city. So I ask that that money uh, come back not only to the schools, but when we enter the contract negotiations to get the staffing that we need uh, by retaining our staff who are leaving for better opportunities, whether it be more pay or even a different career field. And by retaining our staff, I believe recruitment will happen naturally. But it all starts with the pay. The pay is the root cause of our issue of why we're losing people and why we need to retain more, or excuse me, why we need to bring in more people. That's gonna naturally draw them. So I believe that that surplus needs to go back instead of nonsensical city uh, capital projects to invest in our people. That was time. Could you just finish your thought, workplaces, please? Workplaces uh, in Western Massachusetts. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And Tim, sorry, just what's your city or town of residence? Uh, Greenfield, Massachusetts. So Thank you. I only work here. <laughs> Next on Zoom is Joyce. Joyce, your name and city or town, please. Uh, 
Are you able to unmute Joyce? I know Joyce is an elderly constituent of mine. This is her first time using Zoom. Okay. Great. We'll come back to you, Joyce. Oh, no, there you are. No, of course. Welcome. Hi, let me start again. Um, I'm Joyce Ball. I uh, live in Northampton for the last four years. Um, I came from uh, New York State. Actually, uh, I lived in New York State for about 50 years, but the last 30, uh, the 30 years I taught in high school. I taught global studies um, in a town near Buffalo called Amherst, New York. Um, I was a, a teacher with a classroom at times of 21, at times during those 30 years, 25, and at times 30. And it was sometimes very difficult for me to, to keep control, to teach, and to give students even emotional support when you have 30 students in the class. So even though I am a retired teacher, I have kept up with what Northampton uh, school system is doing for its students. Because it is about the same that uh, your Northampton school system is about the same size as where I taught. So I was very pleasant, uh, surprised that you are getting some money from the state. Six million, or I believe six to eight million dollars, and I think that is fantastic. Um, I wonder how many council members have been teachers, and because I would like to ask them, what was it like for you when you had a class of 21, and especially today in the social media age? And when you had a class of 30, what was it like when you taught? Or perhaps I would suggest that our council members who make this decision uh, about school funding, um, perhaps you should spend a day in a high school, ninth grade, which I taught. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next in the room is Zara. Name and city or town, please. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Zara. Zara Spawn. I am a junior at Northampton High School. Um, so uh, <laughs> I just want to start off by saying I'm really grateful that the cuts weren't worse. Uh, I, I know that the original budget had much more outlined to be cut, and I know that the goal of the city council is definitely not to cut our, our school budget. I know you're just doing what uh, you feel is best for the city, and I, I want to recognize that. Um, so let's talk about the budget. Um, I have never been in classes this big. Um, they're so big sometimes we don't even have like enough desks um and really it's like it's hard it's hard for students it's hard for teachers it's not fair to have so much work and no, you know extra pay um for the amount of students essays they have to grade tests um our paraprofessionals are overworked um i you can you can ask anyone and uh nhs was already underfunded and again i know I know that you already know this. Um, so I just want to talk about, like, we have such a vibrant community here in Northampton. We have so many educated people who are so dedicated to this community, to making it the best it can be. Um, I have had so many great teachers in my time at Northampton Public Schools, and they've changed my life, and they have just kept me going when I didn't feel like I could. Um, and so I feel like with all this being said, I feel like we can work towards creative solutions. There doesn't have to be a precedent to do something um, that there doesn't have to be precedent in order to do something meaningful. And I feel like we have such a community that we can create something new, something that can be modeled after. If if this isn't the solution that um, the using the free cash isn't the solution that you think is best for the city, I want us to think beyond just. Uh, the the precedent that we're setting like let's let's create bigger we have we have people in this room who are dedicated we can think bigger than this we can think more expansive and we can create solutions that there are maps for um we know like northampton's underfunded with the state we don't have control over that let's advocate um 
and we can work together. And I just wanted to say that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Luke Latella. Hi. Welcome. My name is Luke Rotella. I live at 39 Hinckley Street in Ward 5 of Northampton, and I'm the co-chair of the Western Mass Club of the Communist Party USA. I'm here not only to echo the comments made by other SOS speakers, but to speak on this political moment and how opponents of public education intend to use it. It bears no repeating that we live in an extraordinarily dangerous time. In two months, the extreme right will control all three branches of government. MAGA has put immigrants and transgender people in its crosshairs. Donald Trump has nominated a billionaire for the Department of Education in what will soon be a dire struggle to defend not only that department itself, but all public schools. And we've heard a lot from the mayor and her sycophants about how they're going to put in the work to stop Trump's agenda. You know what work they've been up to when they think we aren't looking? They've been gutting our public schools and equivocating about genocide. And you know what they've got in common with Donald Trump? They're scared to death of the MTA and working class solidarity, and they'll collaborate with anyone to fight it. And when election season rolls around next year, they're going to come out hard with this appeal to their work, like they didn't just fire 20 educators and attack a cornerstone of our society. We won't let them get away with it. We, as workers, as students, as parents and progressive community members, present the only consistent opposition to Donald Trump and the extreme right. And you know what? We do it with a mass movement, and we do it by taking this fight to a mayor who has made it clear which side she's on. Restore the jobs, fully fund the schools, we won't go back. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Modenos. Thank you, Lisa Modenos from Florence. But I'm reading this on behalf of John uh, Chavarella, who couldn't be here. So these are his words. Uh, these aren't happy days in Northampton, which have been driven by decisions about spending on public schools and capital projects. The vibe today reminds me of the battle to expand the landfill. Back then, there was barely disguised contempt for middle-class families of Ward 6, who fought City Hall and its powerful backers against all odds to defeat the ill-conceived landfill expansion. Today's contentiousness is a result of decisions made by the mayor, the council, and their backers, who include the city's most wealthy and influential residents, former officials, and consultants. They all seem to have suddenly lost their appetite for maintaining the high standards for our public schools and other essential services, the fundamentals practically all of us rely on and expect. Instead, they've decided on a much different vision of what this city should be. It's obvious to anyone paying attention that Northampton is evolving into a place filled with exorbitantly priced new housing for wealthy retirees and top wage earners, a place out of reach for median income earners hoping to get on the property ladder, and how convenient that would be for those who run the city. In such a future, we wouldn't need quality public schools because the new residents would either have no young children or could afford to send them to private schools. There'd be no pressure exerted on Smith to end the grotesque unfairness of their tax treatment. With a city of more wealthy residents, there'd be no need for affordable housing except a smattering of rental workforce housing units set aside for those needed to serve the needs of the gentrifiers. And the city would certainly never need to worry about raising taxes because there'd be no pushback from those who can easily afford any property tax override. By using words like resilience and equity to describe some of their plans, our officials keep us eternally hopeful, hide the true nature of their objectives, and assure themselves they haven't completely transmogrified into the divisive neoliberals they seem to resemble. This isn't the vision of a fair, decent, and affordable Northampton so many of us want. It's time for the people running the city to take sides with the majority of people who fear we're getting steamrolled. This is the last line. Make funding our schools, fire department, and other essential services our chief priority today and in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Joan Barberich. Hi, I'm Joan Barberich, Northampton Six resident, yeah. Ward 1. Um, so I want to express overall confusion to start. Um, 
There are logical gaps that I've been struggling with. All the data that comes in suggests that there's unnecessary catastrophes happening within the school and maybe with the people who run ambulances and the fire department. So I just want to acknowledge this confusion and I've read and heard words from you folks um, and I don't buy it. So I want to say that and I want to echo really everything I've heard so far, especially the gentleman early on Zoom who talked about making a different choice to get a different outcome. And so I ask for swift repair to the damage that's happening every day in the schools and then a real look at how to restructure how it works, how line items work, how do you fund the schools in a regular, reliable, dependable, unquestionable way. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Rose Bookbinder. Hi, Rose Bookbinder, Ward 7 in Northampton. And this is my daughter, Bay Bookbinder Wider, who is a second grader at Leeds School. And I'm also here with my daughter, Viva, who is a sixth grader at JFK Middle School. And um, I am the president of the Hampshire Franklin Labor Assembly and a part of the Western Mass Area Labor Federation, which represents uh, 50,000 union members across Western Mass. And um, I guess I wanted to say that this moment, this crisis moment, has really um, created opportunities for solidarity and I guess that would be one uh, positive that I would say out of this is that um, teachers uh, and firefighters and parents and students have now joined together and uh, we believe that um, we're not going to kind of take the uh, comments that if we fund the fire, uh, then we can't fund the schools, or if we can't fund the schools, we can't fund the fire. We um, see the writing on the wall, as Al said, and others have said, um, the free cash that's impending, six to eight million dollars, um, should be allocated to properly uh, fund our schools and restore the jobs. And I guess I believe in you all to have had the time to reflect um, and to opt in. Uh, you've had the time to kind of understand what that looks like and so if the budget that you're presented with does not adequately fund the schools and fund our fire and other essential services that you have the opportunity to allocate those funds so um, I'm just looking into the future and believe that you know we should have a mid-year allocation to restore the jobs but if um, you don't do that which I hope you do that you opt in and get those jobs back um, in this next fiscal cycle and yeah I believe in you guys I think that hopefully you've heard from your constituents there was a thousand um, folks who signed on to a petition we just had over 60 people in the pouring rain um, together uh, calling for that and um, Rose, I think it's time if you could just that, finish that you can do that thank you <laughs> next is Suzanne Strauss Hi, Suzanne Strauss. I live in Florence on Ryan Road. Um, I'm here, also did not prepare my remarks, but I spoke at the school committee recently because I've been teaching at Northampton High School since 1998. And I think that there's a, some talk sometimes about, oh, the same squeaky people talk all the time. And I have this feeling of, instit I have this understanding of sort of institutional memory about Northampton High School. And I think when I started, there was a feeling that our schools were going to soar and that has not been the case and it really comes down to money because we have the people that we have that work in the schools are fantastic and we have a great community but we have to support it I remember in around 1998 when I first started Frank Tudrin was the acting principal and one of the things he said when we were building the new high school or building the additions to the high school, I remember he sp spoke in this right here and he said, this, we should feel ashamed if we do not support the future generations. And when I, when I look around and I think, what do we need? What is 
our moral obligation to the future, it's really hard for me to find something better than supporting young children. We, we, it is our job as adults, as people who are of, a, of the next generation, to take care of the generation that follows. We should make it the best school, the best situation. People want to come and work here. And even if we do, level funding is simply not enough. I mean, I would take it for right now, but it would still be bare bones. It was bare bones before we canceled the 22 people or wh however many we lost. We can do better. We should be, we are progressive, and we should be having the most interesting and exciting education for anybody in the Valley. This is just not acceptable. It's got to stop, and we need to put our money behind it. Thank you. Next is Sophia Zucker. Um, my name is Sophia Zucker. I live in Northampton in Ward 1. Um, and I don't have anything to add to the really powerful things that have been said tonight, but I have heard that there's some concern that members of council have not all heard the statements made by teachers at school committee meetings recently, so I'm going to read one. Um, this is from an elementary classroom teacher who spoke at the school committee on October 10th. And they said, there is much I enjoy about my job, but what I like most is forming relationships with students and creating warm, accepting, and safe classroom learning communities. This can be challenging under normal circumstances, but in an under-resourced building, there are times when it feels impossible. There are 21 kids in my classroom this year, and out of those students, nine are considered high needs and classify as either English learners or special education services students. Only two third graders will benefit from a literacy interventionist this year because we only have one part-time literacy interventionist for the whole school. I am often left alone trying to serve the divergent needs of a large and diverse group of children. In my classroom, there is one student in particular who tugs at the heartstrings. It's a story that feels increasingly common at Bridge Street. A newcomer refugee who arrives with limited formal schooling, cannot read or write, and is completely new to the American school environment. EL teachers already have significant caseloads at our school, so these students come in and receive half an hour each day of English instruction outside the classroom, and perhaps half an hour of support inside the classroom. These are not students who qualify for special education. They don't have one-to-one -one paras, translators, or other individualized support. When placed in the upper grades, they are left to flounder in the mainstream classroom as meeting their needs <coughs> is a painful choice between dedicating teaching time to one-on-one -on -one instruction or serving the rest of the class at their expense. Northampton's values include welcoming immigrants to our community, and I'm grateful to live in a place that welcomes people from around the world. The unfortunate reality is that the schools don't have the systemic resources in place to adequately serve those students, and the responsibility can't solely be put on teachers to figure out how best to serve them. We need help. Northampton should reinstate programs in the elementary schools for newcomers, high-needs special education students, and others who would benefit from a setting where learning is tailored to their needs. I don't have enough time to elaborate on what I think these should look like, but I know that if you wanted more information, teachers, including myself, would be happy to engage and share their ideas. I hope you hear our concerns tonight and take them seriously. Andrea Egito. Good evening, my name is Andrea Egito. I live in Florence and I am the president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. And I'm, I'm here tonight, I, I'm so glad that that wonderful person um, read a statement from one of our teachers because I'd like to read a statement that you all are signing on to tonight. It says, I'm just pulling it up, sorry. We, the undersigned leaders of the city of Northampton, reaffirm our unwavering commitment to being a welcoming, inclusive, and equitable community. <coughs> These principles are the foundation to who we are as a city and are enshrined in our laws, policies, and actions. So I would like to ask you this evening, how is it that a student who is new to our country, a refugee, sometimes homeless, couch surfing, can be in a classroom in Northampton Public Schools of 
upwards of 20, 26 students sometimes, and, re and receive a half hour of English instruction. Is that equitable? Is that inclusive, Mayor? Is that the city that we live in? Nine students out of 21 in that one classroom, and we can list multiple others in, the, in other classrooms in buildings across the city that are considered high needs. That means living in poverty, having special needs, having English as the, a second language that they're trying to learn desperately. And we don't have the support to teach them. So tonight, you're going to hear the mayor read this statement, and you're going to sign on to it. And I beg you to put the money where the words are. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Amber Clooney. Hi, I'm Amber Clooney. I live in Ward 5. Um, I'm going to read a comment from a high school teacher who spoke at the school committee meeting on November 14th. I teach at Northampton High School. My kids went through the schools. My grandson is now at Ryan Road in first grade. I didn't intend to talk today, but then I just, the spirit moved me, and I think what I hear, and I know that people care. We all care about kids. This is something I just want to accept as being true. But I also want to say that we have a process problem, <clears throat> which is something that I've spoken about before. If we keep on doing the same thing the same way, we will have the same problems. And this is the story of 26 years at the Northampton Public Schools. We say the same thing over and over, and the things do not change. So we have to, maybe we need to hire a consultant and have everybody get down there and have the therapy session where we And we were on the cusp of making our district something really special. <clears throat> And somehow now, <coughs> excuse me, in the 26 years that I've been working here, that feels like the air has come out of that balloon. I will have uh, my colleague here read the second half. Uh, Leah, if you could say your name and city or town, and yeah. if you could restart the time. That's what I was going to ask you. Okay. Uh, Leah Gregg, uh, Ward 3, Northampton. And I'm continuing this comment. It seems to me that when we have the money for the band or the jewelry class or whatever the thing is, kids excited about being in school kind of way. We are now getting MCAS because we're not even. You know, I was here before MCAS and it's been destructive to the spirit of educators here. And you to sit here and make nice about s s how some of these things, <laughs> if you want to know how kids are doing, ask the paraeducators and the teachers and ask the kids, how are you doing? And then fund it in a way that says, I see you, I recognize you, and I'm trying to do everything I can for you. You know, we should be having fun at school. It should feel like fun. You know, in kindergarten and first grade and second grade at the Ryan Road School, they have Forest Friday. We should go outside in high school on Tuesday. You know, last Tuesday was a tough day at Northampton High School, and this was right after the election. And a lot. It was a beautiful day. Also, it was like 65 degrees or whatever. And you know what? We had all of these things in place to do stuff for kids, and a lot of people took their kids outside. Thank you. <laughs> Deborah Thompson. Hi, my name is, is this working? Yeah. It, I couldn't hear anything back there, so. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. My name is Deborah Thompson, and I live in Florence, and Andrea kind of stole my thunder, so. Well, I forgot my phone with my speech on it anyway, but um, I was gonna read what she read, because I have to say after going to meetings for 
a year now, both school committee and city council and budget and finance, whether I go to them or I watch them. I know this is not the school committee, but I've seen you all not agree with what the school committee thinks is best for the schools. I've seen you all not agree to opt in when you could make a difference for this budget. So I'm asking you to walk the talk of Northampton. I do think it is right to take care of people who are houseless. I do think it is right that we have a sanctuary city in Northampton. I do think it is right that we declared Northampton a trans sanctuary city at the most important time right now in our history. Some of you are queer. I don't know how the rest of you identify. What are we gonna need to do to make this happen? We need strong schools with mental health support. Our schools are hemorrhaging. So what I'm asking you to do is reprioritize. Build the schools now because a wave of humans are coming to us for help. They deserve it, it's the right thing. The schools, oh, I'm losing my train of thought, um, build the services in the high school. The high school not only lost an English teacher, the result of that was a ripple effect in many other services. A bunch of us had to fight to keep an adjustment counselor. You have to have an IEP or a 504 to pretty much get an appointment. There's like one other person. When a crisis happens in the high school, there's very few people who are designated to help. I'm out of time. Okay, please do something, you guys. Please rely on us. We can help. We can do work. We can do research. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Bertini. Hi, Andrea Bertini, and this is my son, Charlie. Um, last week at the school committee meeting, a line item, special education outside contracted employees, was highlighted as being over budget by 300%. This line item was a known number from last academic year, but was grossly underfunded when the budget was voted upon in July. On Tuesday, just two days after that meeting, we received an email from Matt Holloway cutting our son's outside contracted provider. They have no one in the district with the combined qualifications to continue his interventions while also allowing him full access to the curriculum. It took us four years of fighting to get our son the help he needed because back when he was in elementary school, they didn't have the staff and resources then to help him either. Additionally, Matt Holloway and the district made this decision unilaterally and solely to help balance a budget line item. Not only are they ripping away a trusted person and the one person qualified to help integrate his complex profile and to add insult to injury, they are removing him without our consent from physical education as a direct consequence and impact of this cut. This is just the cost of doing business though. He is just part of the collateral damage of a mayor and some of you on city council, a superintendent and a director of student services who don't care what happens to my kids or any of the kids being tossed away. When my son asked why we, they were doing this to him, we had to tell him. It's in the name of fiscal stability, a triple A bond rating and a way to go from the Department of Revenue. Thank you. Thank you, and your city or town, Florence? Florence. Thank you. Kathy McNally. I'm sorry, I just came, <laughs> I came from work. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, I wanna talk about uh, the federal, uh, what's happening. City or oh, yeah, Kathy McNally, uh, Northampton Ward 1. Everyone's so concerned about what's happening with the new administration, federal administration, me too. And I read that Matt Gates dropped out today so that that leaves so, uh, uh, gives us some time to have attention to some of the other ones. And of course the one that most people in the schools are worried about is Linda McMahon, um, who was formerly of Worldwide Entertainment, which is wrestling. So people are saying Linda McMahon, as head of Department of Education, she's going to dismantle that. We are really concerned about education. We think that she might just, you know, they want to get rid of it. They don't care about education. 
So I want to say something kind of startling, and that is, what's the difference between what she's doing and what we're doing? Now, I know that's shocking because you don't want to dismantle education, but the impact is pretty dramatic. And so one thing is like, well, it's a weird instance of working across the aisle, weird bipartisanship, but are we different than those Republicans and those MAGA people that we're about to have the, you know, months of judgment and shade and clutching our pearls and saying, do you believe them? They have no respect for education. But I want to ask, is it possible that one difference is Democrats sometimes do what Republicans do, and the difference is we feel really bad about it. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Marsha Morris. Uh, hi, I'm Marsh Morrison. I'm from Ward 3, Northampton. That's a tough fact to follow. Um, and I also feel like I came on a bad night to talk about reparations. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm one of the commissioners of the Reparation Commission, and we formed a committee um, for community engagement and um, communications. It's a sub, we are a work group. Um, we're called, and um, a part of our strategy for engaging the community, one is to start what we call the uh, Reparations Religious Roundtable. We've engaged um, the Unitarian Church uh, and B'nai B'rath Israel as our beginning partners, they have been working on out on uh, reparations projects on their own. <laughs> the, one uh, uh, Unitarian was working on an idea of bringing a film festival to um, Northampton, and we decided to support that. And I sent around the flyer for that, and. Um, one of the things that they asked from us was for BIPOC leadership. And so we are actually sending the chairperson, Usman uh, Power Green, and Renika uh, Tamaklo will also be um, speaking. So they'll be speaking at this event. And I wanted everyone to know about it because this is the first, this is the kickoff for how we are going to begin the process of engaging community people by going where they're at, where they're working on projects for reparations, and then pulling those people together to help us to communicate with others. Is that two minutes up? That's time, Marsha, yeah. Okay, so thank you. I'll, I'll send these out to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Signed up. Oh, yes. No. Oh, oh. 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 There's a pencil here, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, and we'll, we'll make a call for more people to speak. You don't all have to put your name here right now. Okay. Thank you. Next is Nathan Tasker. My name is Nathan Taskin, better known as Nas. I'm a paraeducator at Northampton High School, and I also live in Northampton. And the fact that I both live and work in Northampton is relevant to what I'm about to say. Now, I said I'm a para, but that really doesn't fully describe what I do. The best way to describe myself and my role within ANHS is that I'm kind of like a Swiss Army knife in human form. 
when people ask me if I'm a one-to-one, -one, I say, no, I'm a 900-to-one. -one. Throughout the day, I don the role of teacher, reading specialist, hall monitor, disciplinarian, bodyguard, counselor, therapist, life coach, comedian, entertainer, and social worker. I don't flip between these roles period to period or day to day. I alternate between them minute to minute, second to second. And I can only speak for myself, but I suspect that what I'm saying resonates with many other pairs as well. And I say all this not to bemoan, not, <clears throat> not to bemoan my predicament or go, oh, woe is me. I say all this because I really like doing what I do. I like wearing all the different hats. However, it does take a physical and mental toll, one that would be alleviated if I and other paras were paid more. And that brings me to my final point. The first of the month is coming, and that means rent is due. I'm not exactly a spendthrift, and I don't have any kids, but I'm still concerned about where I'll be left financially when that happens, when the first of the month comes up. Now let's let this sink in. I'm paid by the city of Northampton, yet somehow I can barely afford to live in Northampton. Fund our schools. Thank you. Next is Loli Viana. Hello, good evening, Council. I am going to read a public comment that took place uh, the other day, 11-14, at the school committee. This is by the band director at the Northampton High School. Uh, it will be summarized. I won't get to everything, but I will start here. This past year, we had a 57-person marching band and expect to have larger numbers the next years having survived and thrived post-COVID. $833 is the budget I have is not enough to replace a single instrument, nor is it enough to fund a single round trip of, of bus ride to a local event for the band. This puts our band in a tricky position when it comes to performing in public and serving a new crop of instrumentalists each year. I reached out to other districts to ask about their budget funding for their band programs, and Northampton, unfortunately, was the lowest funded district I could find in my research. Comparable districts have much higher budgets for their instrumental programs. For example, in comparison to our $833, Amherst and Frontier's budget for band is alone $7,000. Agawam, West Springfield, and Chicopee have a band budget of $12,000. I'll email these figures to school committee members after the meeting. Of course, our band, like many bands, uses fundraising and community donations to supplement their budgets. However, here in Northampton, we are relying on fundraising and donations for our basic operating costs, including paying for buses to events that we are required to play at. In addition, it is important to note that inflation has made paying for these basic costs even more difficult. A higher classroom supply budget for the band would allow the band to repair and clean its marching uniforms, which I'm biased, but I think they are the best looking uniforms in the Valley. That's After time, now, I think you just finish. Cleaned without a separate fundraiser in order to do so. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure I can read. Is it John Goldman? Jay Goldman? Jan? Ian. Ian. Ian, Ian. Ian Goodman. It's very typical. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Welcome. You don't need to sign up. We'll oh, be okay. calling for people okay. further after we're done with this list. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, my name is Ian Goodman. I live in Northampton. Uh, I have a seven year old in second grade in Northampton Public Schools. I'm your voter. I've held signs for you guys. I've donated to your campaigns. I've, I've, I've rallied my friends to support Override. I've been here for 20 years. So I want you guys to know who it is that's saying this to you. You're my leaders. And I'm so disappointed in what's been happening in my city. I'm so hurt 
because you're hurting my child who's in a classroom of 25 other kids. You're starving our city services. You're harming our city. We are worse off because of your leadership than we were last year. Worse off. How can this happen? How is this okay? How is this something that's even possible in a city like Northampton? One of the things that I try to teach my seven-year-old is that when he does something wrong, he should apologize and try to make it right. You guys should try to make it right. You have the opportunity. You have money. You can put it in places where it matters to the kids of the city. You can put it in places where it matters to the people that live here. Instead of stuffing, van instead of, instead of stuffing money into vanity projects and overflowing cash reserve funds, you can make it right. I apologize if you do something wrong. I'm sorry I voted for you. See how hard that was? Thank you. On Zoom is Paula Regano Murray. Paula? Yep. Welcome. Your name and city or town? I'm Paula Regano Murray, and I live in Northampton. And I'm going to read a statement from a teacher from Bridge Street Elementary School. I teach third grade at Bridge Street, and I have 22 students in my class. The needs in my room are incredibly wide-ranging, from students who can't read yet and don't know the alphabet to students who are reading at a fifth grade level. I have five English, English language learners, two of whom speak no English at all, and only one of whom can read in any language. I have students who are still learning to count and identify numbers, and students who already know all of their multiplication tables. To be asked to differentiate lessons at this level is an impossible task. Furthermore, for the kids who speak no English, their day is incredibly tedious. We do not have enough ELL teachers to fully support newcomers in an English-speaking classroom. They are disengaged and their needs are not being met. The incredible range of, my social, of social maturity in my room makes me feel like I am teaching a K-5 through multi-age class. Some kids can handle a 15 to 20 minute lesson, but many cannot sit still and attend for any length of time without constant reminders. Many kids need social support throughout the day. Most of the kids do not have the ability to differentiate between a problem that they can solve on their own and a problem they need to involve a teacher in. This means that I spend much of my day trying to help them make these distinctions, and I am frequently taken away from the group and from instruction to investigate conflicts. I'm alone almost all day, every day. I'm so fatigued by the social and emotional demands of the kids, the extreme inattention, and the vast ac academic needs that my ability to process and make decisions has slowed down. I find it hard to find the energy to plan lessons, not to mention execute them. When Northampton closed the sub-separate programs in favor of inclusion, they said there would be co-taught class classes. Then after a few years, those were taken away. There are no general ed powers anymore and not nearly enough special educators and interventionists. There is no ceiling to the needs that teachers are asked to meet, and there seems to be no floor to the supports that are taken away. Paula, that's this, time if you could just finish your sentence, please. There's one sentence left. It is this district's responsibility to create the conditions needed for teaching and learning to happen. We ask that you take our testimony seriously and act to address the immense challenges we are facing. Thank you. Thank you. Next in the room is Melissa Masaborski. Uh, half an hour. Your name and city or town, please. Melissa Makaborski. I live in Northampton. Northampton does not have a deficit. It has a very large surplus. What Councillor Rothenberg and others predicted has come true. 
we have an excess of free cash ready to be certified yet again, six to eight million dollars. And history is all set to repeat itself. But this time, something is different. Listen. Do you hear that? This is the sound of the community paying attention. It's the sound of us saying we believe our teachers and we believe in our children. The sound of the community showing up again and again to advocate for their needs. The sound of people asking simple questions that elected officials refuse to answer. The sound of teachers pleading for help and the sound of children hurting. This is the sound of the community saying no. Things will be different this time in our city. Over and over again in history, moral change has come when people are willing to take a moment and consider, are you one of them? Are you one of them? <coughs> Listen, change is happening right now in Northampton. We all know that we have the money to fund all of our essential services, including the schools. We know, we all know that legally free cash can be used for any purpose. We all know that year after year, the city intentionally generates more free cash than it needs to and stores it away. The money has piled up and now our savings are overflowing. We could budget differently and easily afford our essential services, but so far, we haven't. Listen, it's time for a second opinion on our finances. It's time to be brave and to know there's nothing wrong with asking questions, to know it's okay to speak your mind. And there's nothing wrong with standing up and doing the right thing. We want full transparency and evidence-based answers that take into account the reality of our large savings and the truth of what That's people time. are experiencing in our city. Children are hurting, and we are not meeting the basic needs of our community members. Listen, something is different. We are here, and we are staying. Change is here. Please thank join you. us. Some of you have listened, and to those of you who I'm have, sorry, just thank you. Of, of to those of you who have not, access to everyone, we respectfully to ask, ask that you either make an effort to listen or step aside for someone who will. We have to be this equal, is our city. Equal, um, listen. Time for everyone. Fund our schools. Thank you. Next in the room is Nathan Chung. Hi, uh, Nathan Chung, Wharf Board resident and a city employee at the planning office, speaking as a general member of the public. Um, and finance is not my purview. So I want to bring a different point of view that fiscal stability and adequately funding city services, including schools, they are not mutually exclusive goals. For a stable and healthy city, both needs to be achieved. And about the free cash concept, so I read on the Monday's budget listing session that there is a 2016 February recommendation from the State Department um, recommending that free cash percentage per year be 3 to 5 percent. You can Google it. Just Google for free cash um, Massachusetts State, and you will find it on the top of the list. So. I know it's very important to not only look at the actual numbers, but the percentage of it. You're not just looking at one particular department when it comes to any kind of budgeting, but the, how all the different budgets fit together as a system as a percentage. So just to as an example, so eight million seems like that will be the likely free cash this year. Eight million dollars is 5.8 percent of last year's or this year's total city budget. So it's like 0.8 percent above the state recommended percentage. So what would that mean to actually go, you know, go not according to the state recommendation, go below that? And I don't think one needs to be sacrificed to achieve the other. Maybe a tax increase is necessary, or maybe there are inefficiencies in different departments or. Some projects, you know, doesn't need to be achieved. And that's a very hard question, but I want to say that just having the single minded view that the city is sitting on a lot of free cash when it's actually 5.8% of, of the total budget, and that's the only solution we need to pursue, is very problematic, especially for a very complex issue like this one. You have to explore different uh, pros and cons of different approaches and try to come up together with a solution that works to the benefit of everyone not just a particular group of people or a particular department. So, and I know people have been saying that cities have been wasting money on other projects when they can move all their money into schools. The popular saying, I'm gonna lastly say, sure. some of the money 
is regulated by the federal and state regulation to not go into other places, and it's actually illegal to put it into general operations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Would anyone else like to speak? I think there was someone who was trying to sign up. No more? Okay. Is there anyone else in the room or on Zoom who would like to speak? All right. My name is Tish Serrani. I live in Florence. I've had 33 foster kids between East Hampton and Northampton. I'll say part of what I said at the school committee the other night. I've seen a lot of IEPs and 504s. <coughs> And they don't really work to the letter of the law. A lot of these kids are black, brown. They come from really hard situations, and they're not being educated. But yet, I see a lot of people in this room that have marched up and down Main Street, have worn the pink hats, have been the crusaders, have been the, have been the people that have protested, that have been active, have done their job for social justice, but you're not for the schools. You have no idea what's going on in the schools. You can't call yourself a social justice warrior when you underfund schools. They are the basic of our society. Why call yourself the city of Northampton if you're underfunding your schools? Doesn't that come first? Fire, police, schools? Really, we're not educating all our schools. Maybe the kids that can afford to go to tutors. All our kids are leaving. They're going to charter schools. You know about charter schools, Alan. They're going to private schools. Who can afford to stay in Northampton and educate their kids anymore? Maybe the people that have million dollar houses. Maybe the people that have $700,000 condos. You know, a tutoring place on, in Florence on Maple Street. They're growing. Guess why? Because our schools suck. So everybody that can afford to go to tutoring, send their kids to tutoring right down the street from JFK. Their kids can walk there to go to tutoring because our schools aren't meeting the needs of our students. So talk about social justice. Talk about students in school. Otherwise, you're not a social justice warrior. Thank you. Next on Zoom is Din. Your name and city or town, please. Doug, is it working? Oh. It's working. We can hear you. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Jennifer James. I'm a resident of Northampton. I live in Ward 2A. I have a high school student at Northampton High School. I have a graduate of Northampton High School. Um, I just want to say, as a citizen, if it's possible to use this free cash to help our schools, I just want to, as a citizen, speak out and say, please do that if it's possible. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to. When my son is at the high school. He has, um, he's a junior. And unfortunately, many seniors that he's acquainted with didn't get the classes that they signed up for this year. And they are currently in pass-fail classes that are making them less competitive in the early application period for colleges, even though they've been working for four years as hard as they can to get admitted because of the lack of teachers at the high school. They didn't get their classes, and they're taking classes that they were put into that they didn't choose, that they're being graded pass-fail in. And I don't know how it works for you guys with the college stakes, but one or two pass-fail classes that you haven't chosen makes you increasingly less competitive when you only have four classes in a semester. So where, if it's possible, as a citizen, I just would like to say, please, if you can put some of this money back into our schools and lift us back up, I hope you take that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room or on Zoom who would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, we will take a 10-minute recess and resume the meeting.
come back at 7.50. <coughs>
Welcome back to the Northampton City Council. Next on our agenda is announcements from councilors and the mayor. Councilor Lavarge. Thank you. Um, I want everybody to mark your calendars. November 30th on Saturday at 10 o'clock a.m. The Florence and Civic Business Association want all of us to get festive by the annual holiday parade. Join us at the Trinity Row Park at 9.30 a.m. We will kick off the celebration with an exciting parade stepping off at 10 a.m. We will march west on Route 9. Bring you all joy, cheer, all the way to the Florence Civic Center. Plus, this will be the chance to catch with Santa and Mrs. Claus before their holiday schedule gets packed. And believe me, it gets packed. Don't miss out on the parade. Parade duration is about an hour and 30 minutes. Reminder, come and march with all of us. We all need to come together. Bring the children and families. It is critical here for our city of Northampton, Florence, and Leeds. Get together. Let's have an enjoyable holiday for our children and families. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Elkins. Um, yeah, I just want to announce that um, Legislative Matters um, and Planning Board will be having a joint meeting on um, December 9th at 6.30 um, to take up the zoning um, ordinance that was um, referred to Legislative Matters and Planning Board at our last meeting. And um, the, the Legislative Matters portion of them uh, will also, I think, have some more things referred to it. So. This wasn't a very organized announcement. So there will be a legislative matters meeting. I believe it's gonna start at 5.30 or 6, depending on what's referred tonight. Um, and then a joint portion of it beginning at 6.30 with the planning, planning board. Um, so stay tuned for the exact start date, but the date for the joint meeting will definitely be the 9th. And um, that portion of it will start at 6.30, so. Thanks. Other announcements? Councillor Perry. Yeah, I uh, apologize for someone already said this, but I just wanted to let everyone know that this Saturday, uh, November 23rd, is Northampton Bag Day. Uh, it is just a lovely day of dining and shopping. There are over 70 uh, retail outlets and restaurants who are participating. Uh, get your bags. This is part of the Northampton fabric. Uh, if you don't have a bag already, you can get one from a participating restaurant. Uh, parking is free for that whole day. Um, and if they are out of bags at a participating restaurant, you can get them from the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce or the Daily Hampshire Gazette uh, between 10 and 3 o'clock tomorrow, which is your last day. Uh, and you might even see me splitting about. So enjoy. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to presentations. The first is an update on City Hall closure for asbestos remediation. Mayor Shara. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, so starting on Monday, December 2nd, Northampton City Hall will close for at least four weeks for the asbestos abatement and insulation work in the attic that the council authorized this year. Um, these needed improvements address the long-standing infrastructure needs. Um, uh, uh, they address long-standing infra infrastructure needs, um, enhance energy efficiency, and probably most importantly, uh, will make it possible to do the roof repairs that are badly needed on City Hall. So during this time, City Hall departments and employees will work remotely and or from temporary locations. Uh, I want to stress that email is the best way to reach any City Hall department during this time. Um, if you need to visit one of these temporary locations that I'm going to go through, please call or email um, that office to make an appointment. And um, all the departments in City Hall, for all everyone in City Hall, the regular phone numbers will still be this phone number. So the phone number is on the website. That's who you call even though they will be in different locations uh, during this time. Um, I also want to make sure everyone knows that 
Um, all of the municipal offices are closed for Thanksgiving uh, beginning Wednesday, November 27th at 12 p.m. and won't reopen until Monday, December 2nd. Um, I want to give really great thanks to the, city, uh, the Central Services Department for organizing everything and creating temporary locations for everyone. This was a kind of a, you know, a puzzle to um, get everyone out of City Hall and then figure out places where people could be. Um, and they, uh, it includes giving up some of their own space in, in uh, their department. Um, so I want to thank them. I also want to thank the, the police department and uh, the senior center for helping to create temporary spaces for everyone um, from City Hall. So the temporary locations for the mayor's office and licensing will be in the police station. Again, call the regular mayor's office number or email us at regular address, which is mayor at northamptonma.gov. Um, planning and sustainability, the temporary location will be at the senior center. Uh, office of the assessor, the temporary location, um, is in the central services office in Memorial Hall. The office of the auditor, the temporary location is in the senior center. The city clerk's office and the registrar of voters, that temporary location is in central services um, in Memorial Hall as well. And then for the city council, uh, will be remote, is that correct? Yes. So. Again, call the regular city council number, any of these regular um, department office numbers, and you'll be able to reach someone. And if you need, if you have a need where you need to meet someone in person, um, make arrangements and someone can meet you in one of these temporary locations. So thank you everyone for your patience during this time. Um, it is a big uh, thing to shut down City Hall, but um, it is very badly needed and I think we'll all rest a little easier when the asbestos is gone. And then again, um, we need to, there's a lot of um, issues with the roof and leaking, and that will be the next project that will be able to happen once uh, we can safely access the attic. So thank you everyone for that. Um, and then, should we move on to the next Yes, item? our next <coughs> presentation is a statement reaffirming Northampton's commitment to inclusion and safety. This is Mayor Shera and Javier Luengo Garrido uh, from the ACLU of Massachusetts. Yes, thank you. So I want to share with the council and the community um, that the city released a statement this week reaffirming the city's commitment to inclusion and safety, uh, which was signed by me as mayor, the police chief, John Cartledge, and the health and human services commissioner, Meredith O'Leary. Um, and then I would like to welcome up Javier Luengo Garrido, um, who's the organizing strategist from the ACLU of Massachusetts, to talk about the work he's done with Northampton and to give his thoughts in light of what is being uh, threatened by the incoming presidential administration regarding deportation of immigrants. Um, you already got a preview of this, but I will go ahead and read it. We, the undersigned leaders of the city of Northampton, reaffirm our unwavering commitment to being a welcoming, inclusive, and equitable community. These principles are foundational to who we are as a city and are enshrined in our laws, policies, and actions. Today, as always, we stand united in support of all who live in, work in, or visit Northampton, regardless of their immigration status, their gender identity, or other protected characteristics. Northampton is dedicated to fostering safety and dignity for all members of our community. On November 14th, we became aware that the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, was reportedly in pursuit of a specific individual in Northampton. This action was carried out independently, and the Northampton Police Department was not involved in any way. The enforcement of federal immigration laws is outside the authority of lo local law enforcement, and Northampton has a long-standing policy of non-cooperation with such actions to the extent permissible by law. Northampton has had no further information about this action by ICE. Northampton's commit commitment to sanctuary has been repeatedly affirmed over the years. In 2011, the City Council unanimously adopted a resolution of the Northampton City Council on the Secure Communities Program, expressing its opposition to federal immigration enforcement programs and urging the city to prioritize community trust and public safety. In 2014, an executive policy order by Mayor David Norkowitz formally prohibited the Pol Northampton Police Department from honoring ICE detainer requests that were non-criminal and not supported by a judicial warrant. Next, these principles were codified in the Northampton Safe City Ordinance um, of, uh, in the Code of Ordinances, which was adopted on December 5th, 2019. I then, uh, a city councilor, was a co-sponsor of that ordinance along with Elisa Klein and Bill Dwight. And that affirms that city resources shall not be used to, one, determine the immigration status of a person unless such inquiry is required by state or federal law, or to provide a public benefit. Two, to take action on the basis of actual or perceived immigration status 
unless to provide a public benefit, to neither detain nor delay the release of an individual otherwise eligible for release from custody on the basis of an immigration detainer, and to perform the functions of an immigration officer, whether pursuant to uh, 8 U.S.C. Uh, subsection 1357G or any other law, regulation, or policy, whether formal or informal, and that a person's immigration status shall not prohibit or inhibit the city's participation in any government operation or program that confers an immigration benefit, including temporarily or permanently protecting non-citizens from removal as provided through programs such as the U visa and the T visa and the Federal Violence Against Women Act. These policies and ordinances bolstered, were bolstered by resolutions and city actions that remain in effect today, and they include in 2018 a council resolution denouncing and demanding an end to President Trump's zero tolerance immigration policy, and also in 2018 a resolution to preserve DACA and to extend temporary protected status for all nationals who cannot safely return to their home countries. They reflect, reflect the values of Northampton leaders, supported by the tireless advocacy of Northampton's caring residents, community groups, and legal organizations. Furthermore, we remain steadfast in our commitment to protecting the rights and privacy of all individuals, including those seeking reproductive or gender-affirming care. This week, um, I also issued a new executive policy order that reaffirms and strengthens Northampton's dedication to these protections. The order builds upon Massachusetts 2022 legislation which safeguards individuals seeking sanctuary from out-of-state investigations and ensures that no city resources are used to assist with investigations or actions targeting lawful health care activities, including gender-affirming care. <coughs> Excuse me. This action aligns with, North, uh, um, with our values, and I thank the Council for its recent adoption of the resolution, which declared Northampton a sanctuary city for transgender and gender-diverse individuals. And with this pol and uh, with which the policy that I issued aligns, um, I hope we'll talk more about that policy at a future meeting. Um, and but I want to thank um, uh, Councillor Clemmer and Councillor Mayori, who's not here, who brought forward that resolution. Um, Together, these measures underscore Northampton's unwavering dedication to ensuring equity, dignity, and safety for all. And we affirm that Northampton is and will remain a community where all are treated with dignity and humanity. Our commitment to these values is unwavering. We remain united in our belief that inclusion and equity are cornerstones of a just and a vibrant community. And again, that was signed by me, Chief Cartledge, and Commissioner O'Leary. Um, so I wanted to share that with that. And with that, I'd love to welcome up Javier. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Councillors. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the Mayor. Um, in 2019, uh, myself and a colleague, uh, Jeff Napolitano from then the Resistance Center for Peace and Justice, we were with Councillor Elkin, then Councillor Shara, and Councillor Dwight codifying uh, certain parameters of the relationship of the police department in relation to the interaction with the immigrant <coughs> community. Um, as you remember, during the first Trump administration, one of the ways how people were funneled to ICE detention was uh, during uh, casual, regular traffic stops. Uh, what we find that during those traffic stops, ICE would inquire, uh, police department would inquire uh, either contra birth, nationality, and immigration status. As you may think, immigration status uh, is not relevant if I'm being pulled over for running a red light or if I'm not wearing my seatbelt. Uh, because that information was being acquired by the police department, when ICE inquired uh, that kind of report, they would learn that it's a foreign national, the one who was detained. So it was sensitive uh, for us as ACLU and other advocacy groups to codify in a way that uh, that kind of information was not gathered by the police department. And in this case, uh, we were able to work in a language that no city official should do it and no city resources should be allocated in the collection of that information so we keep our neighbors safe. Um, one of the main points that we used during the process was the fact that we want our immigrant neighbors to be able to feel confident coming forward denouncing being victims of a crime or denouncing any kind of legal infraction in their lives. And if they don't feel confident enough, they are protected enough by the community. We're not going to see that, including victims of domestic violence or uh, child neglection. Um, right now, uh, we're getting into dire times uh, with, the with the next administration at the White House. And I think it's important for the city of Northampton 
uh, to re-energize and also reconfirm the commitment of codifying, of doing the, the extra work of making clear that the city of Northampton is a safe city for immigrants, for anybody who chooses to come to the state of Massachusetts. Um, I'm also willing to answer questions if there is any questions in relationship to the ordinance that we passed with the city council in 2019. I know that some members of the public has been a little bit confused by the press release that the city of Amherst put out in relation to the, any kind of cooperation that the police department of, this, of our city has done or not. Um, and also, there is a section that Mayor Charter also read from the ordinance, which is related to a T visa, U visa, which states that this ordinance doesn't forbid uh, the Northampton Police Department of cooperating when an immigrant is pursuing an immigration benefit such as U visa, which is meant for people who are collaborating with law enforcement in the persecution of a crime or were victims of a qualifying crime. This also includes, uh, for example, VAWA or a T visa. VAWA is the Violence Against Women's Act, and a T visa is uh, it's against uh, human trafficking. So I'm open to answer questions from, from counselors. Counselors? Questions? Anyone on Zoom? Councilor Elkins. Um, I don't have a question, but I uh, just wanted to thank you, Javier, and, and uh, Mayor, for this presentation. Um, I'm very glad that we have things in place um, for us to build on, and I'm happy, call me anytime, I'm happy to uh, continue, help continue this work. Um, and you know, I think it. I think um, you know this. This is this could come at some sacrifice to the city. You know, this commitment, um, and uh, and I'm glad that we are standing strong in the face of it. That we are working to see what we can do to continue on um, this commitment. So I just wanted to say thank you. I'm glad that we have this partner with the ACLU with with you, um, and that we. Um, We'll, we'll continue to be this city and to do this work. So thank you. Thanks, Councilor Larkin. <laughs> Councilor Labarge. Thank you. I want to say thank you to you. The commission worked tirelessly on that. That did not happen overnight, three to four to five months, quite a while. But the police commission that was put in place, I voted in full support of that as a city councilor. And I think change was needed at that time. There was no question about it. I think also, too, just with some of the language that was in there, we now also, too, have a chief, a new chief. And what I like about it, that he's out there. He's out there talking with residents. And it's happening on my ward even before he came chief appointed as chief. If there's problems, I let him know about it. We go up and talk. And it's the respect of listening, which is so valuable to so many people in this community. So I wanna thank you for being part of making this happen also, and the whole commission. It is definitely in dire need to have that put in place. So thank you. Thanks, Mr. Lovart. Um, has been uh, key the willingness of the city to be able to, to create instances of collaboration and building confidence with the community. Um, I work every day with undocumented folks that live in the city, uh, and they do feel safer because of the, this kind of codification, mm -hmm. and the city of Northampton being willing to do it. Um, as ACLU, we're looking forward to keep working with the city. Um, I, uh, we do have certain possible recommendations <laughs> <laughs> to to update uh, uh, the the ordinance, and 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 we can talk in a different opportunity about those recommendations. Um, 
but certainly the ability of having a police department that is actually open to be able to to have this, I mean, we had the support of the of the of the police chief when we did this. We were able to do this thanks to the massive amount of uh, support from the city council and the community. Um, right now, uh, during the Trump administration, we saw so much family separation, and a lot of people were paying attention to family separation at the border. But the reality is that family separation. Uh, was happening here in Massachusetts with people being taken away from their families, people going to, uh, uh, to drop their kids to school and being stopped by ICE. Um, and I know that in the lat latest news we have learned about uh, an increase of enforcement in Western Mass, and that's something that is actually happening right now. So the willingness of municipalities and towns to be able to upgrade those ordinances, to keep working with the ACLU, on this, it's key. So I really appreciate your word, uh, Councillor Labarge. Thanks. Councillor Clemmer. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming tonight, Javier. Um, I know how hard you worked during the first administration, and yeah. <laughs> um, you were at a lot of my rallies, and we worked together to do the um, providing rides for immigrants that needed rides to their court appointments and mm -hmm. uh, doctor's appointments, and um, and. Um, I just, I'm sorry we have to do this again, and um, it's going to probably get bad this time and maybe worse, but, um, you know, we're here to support you, and, and um, it's really great to have a mayor who's on board and police department who's also supportive. So um, just thanks for all your hard work. Because of the corner, I, I do remember <laughs> those rallies. I do remember all the work and how the community came together for those people, as you know, at that time, uh, the diff big, one of the big difference with now is that now undocumented folks can ac have access to a driver license, mm -hmm. to a standard driver license. But at that time, they would not, right? And they needed to go to court appointments. They needed to be able to go to doctor's appointment. And not being able to drive was extremely uh, pervasive in their lives, mm -hmm. right? So uh, those instances where the community came together uh, there were people giving the rights. There were people willing to walk people uh, where they needed to go uh, do a complement to court appointments or a complement to ICE uh, uh, check-ins in Hartford. Mm -hmm. uh, making, making that kind of commitment for, as somebody who works every day with undocumented folks, people felt seen, people felt value, and they felt part of the community. And I think the opportunity that we have right now in our hands is to keep showing that people belong here, that they are our neighbors, they are uh, our immigrant children that are going to our schools, that they are their parents working in our city. And I think the city of Northampton uh, under Mayor Sharsley's leadership will show again during the next uh, administration in the White House that we are going to keep fighting and keeping our community members here where they belong. Yeah, it's just wonderful how many people signed up to provide the rides because if people missed their appointment, they could be sent back and- they, They'd be subject uh, to re-detention because yeah. it would be a violation of the conditions of release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if just to get their, uh, they had, sometimes they had ankle bracelets or something, just to get them checked for a five minute appointment. Yes. Um, and they weren't given much of a heads up Absolutely. And, and, you know, it, under uh, New England winter, being able to do a full ride from Northampton to Hartford for that kind of like five minutes appointment, many times people wouldn't be able to do it with the help of other community members. Mm -hmm. Any other counselors have questions, comments? Well, um, I will echo what my fellow counselors have said and, and that I look forward to hearing of those suggested revisions. Uh, and please be in touch. And thank you for coming. Thank you so much, President Jerry. Thanks, everybody. Mayor, did you have anything to add? No. OK. Thank you both. We will move on to the consent agenda. The uh, consent agenda contains the minutes of November 7th, 2024. 24.159, an order to establish a tax classification for fiscal year 2025 in second reading. 24.162, an order to reprogram funds to purchase NHS dishwasher in second reading. 
24.165, an application for di supervised display of fireworks, first night. Uh, this is for by the City of Northampton, Northampton Arts Council for the par at the parking garage uh, on first night at 6.15 p.m. And 24.167, appointments to Board of Assessors and Housing Partnership for referral to city services. To the Board of Assessors, Mary Penny, filling the position of Sean Sullivan. To the Housing Partnership, Benjamin Wood, filling the position of Ace Taylor. Are there any removals from the consent agenda? so that we may uh, discuss them. Thanks. Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move to approve. Second. Motion second. made by Councillor <coughs> Elkins and seconded by Councillor Labarge. <coughs> uh, no discussion on the consent agenda, so roll call, please. Councillor Dobbs. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Sorry. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. And Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. Okay, that uh, passes unanimously. Um, that brings us to financial orders on first reading. 24.168, an order to appropriate $149,472 from Special Education Stabilization Fund to fiscal year 2025 Northampton Public Schools budget. This is in first reading, and uh, would someone from the mayor's office like to present? Um, sure. So... Uh, the school committee budget and properties subcommittee um, recommended this as did the full uh, the full school committee voted um, in favor of this appropriation of the this is the remainder of the annual amount um, from the special ed stabilization fund um, so that to get to the 350,000 it's uh, 149,472 dollars and um, you have a memo on attached to your agenda from Matt Holloway who's the director of student services um, that details this. Um, Superintendent Bonner is also on the Zoom and is available to speak to it. Um, these funds, as they were intended to um, uh, be for um, an unanticipated special education costs, um, these plus uh, state cir circuit breaker funds will be used to address um, some unanticipated costs that have that have arisen. Um, so. If there are sort of specific questions about what they'll be used for, Dr. Bonner is available to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, questions for the mayor, staff, or Dr. Bonner, who I believe is now a uh, co-host. Um, sorry, you have just checking remote and here. <laughs> um, so I have a question, which is, so is there a circumstance where we would draw more than this amount from the fund? I know that our policies dictate that it that is not, not is not within our policies. Um, I mean, it's not the, the policy; it's the order that was passed by the council and the school committee. Uh, I, And so why do we have more than the maximum in the fund? Uh, is it for interest or potential change in the policy in the future? Or just like, why didn't we just put the 350000 into the fund? So, so the way that the fund is replenished every year is from the Medicaid reimbursement, right. which is a, some, has generally been somewhere around $200,000. So the reason I think if I answer, if I understand your question the reason we we seeded it with more money than just the 350 is because we want this fund to be able to continue. And so um we since the Medicaid reimbursement is less and the the other um the other things that feed the fund are um a small amount of of tailings that get returned to the city most of the tailings tailings are sort of the equivalent of undesignated funds or free cash for schools um most of those get retained by the schools there's a small amount that gets returned to the city that would be um part of this fund and then or turn backs they're called um 
and then any interest. So in order to keep it perpetuating, you can't take out more than you put in. Um, so we're, we're trying to give it a, a chance to be able to, um, to, to maintain or be able to uh, sustain. Mm -hmm. So next year, if we receive, two, say, $200,000 in Medicaid reimbursement, that will go in. Will 200 then be the maximum we can take out, or will it be 350 It'll be 350 So, um, yes, that's exactly. So the amount will stay the same. 350 is the max. Okay. Um, that won't change. But in December, when um, undesignated fund balance is certified, one of the orders that will be brought forward will be um, an order to move funds from the undesignated fund balance into the stabilization fund um, for future use. Mm -hmm. And um, the two amounts is 200000 plus $70,000 in turn backs. Okay. So it'll be 270 something. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, we'll do Councillor Rothenberg and then Councillor Moulton. Yeah, I just have some comments. I just want to remind the councillors that the law, the statute that creates this, does not put a maximum on what you can withdraw. Like most of the maximums around reserves, they put maximums on what the balance can be. They're essentially trying to prevent hoarding of cash. So I don't think this is enough to withdraw. And I also just want to remind counselors that this is exactly what we predicted would happen, was that, that these contracted services would be extremely expensive, more than having the special ed staff that we fired. And we did hear some public comment tonight that was just devastating. I think the child's name was Charlie, who stood with their mother, Andrea Bertini. Their contractor is being fired because it's so expensive. But before that, the teacher had been fired, the interventionist had been fired, the staff. So this is really snowballing in cost, snowballing in damage to the children. It's not enough money. I move that we waive second reading and move this along, but this is not good. Uh, there, that was a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Councilor Rothenberg and seconded by Councilor Elkins to waive second reading. Um, note that that w w it was not requested by the school department to to do this in in two readings uh, tonight, but um, I personally don't have a concern with it move, moving this amount of money forward. Uh, but it's now on the floor for debate. And Councilor Rothenberg, are you raising your hand again? I am not. Okay. Lower it. Is there any discussion on us? Uh, second wa waiving the rules so that we may have a second reading tonight okay seeing none um <clears throat> uh, we'll take a roll call on suspension of rules so that we may vote to oh to councilor clemmer well just um, uh your microphone thank you <coughs> it wasn't about the second reading though it was about something that uh, Councillor Rothenberg said, and a question I have. So we'll have an opportunity to okay, speak to that af after we do this roll call. Okay. So my okay. <laughs> uh, roll call, please, on waiving of rules. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labard. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. And Councillor Dobbs. Yes. Okay, we are resuming discussion. Councilor Clemmer. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want, had a question about something that Councilor Rothenberg said, and I don't know, Director Nardi, maybe you can answer it, or the mayor. Um, the, the money that we're paying for the contract employees, although the salary is high, it's not, um, it's not a recurring expense because they're a contract and we don't have to pay benefits to these people. Is that true or? So this might be a, a better question for Dr. Bonner. I'm not, I am not sure who's being referred to. Yeah, it's just. Oh. Um, Dr. Bonner, would you like to address this question? Hi, Dr. Bonner. Good evening to everyone, thank you. So uh, just clarification, this, this additional request um, 
from the Special Education Stabilization Fund is to cover tuition uh, for two out of district placements. Yeah. So I want, I just want to clarify that, that it's not about contracted services, but it's actual tuition to send students out. And so um, as long as the students are in our care, we will have to continue with this tuition, but we will be able to put it in the base of our operating budget for next year. Thank you. With that, did you have a further question? Well, um, I was just referring to what Councilor Rothenberg said about um, predicting that we were going to be spending all this money on um, contract employees, and um, I mean, I don't know. If, you know, it's different hiring a contract employee rather than um, a permanent employee because you're not, you know, beholden to benefits and health care and pension and all that. So um, I just don't know if that was an accurate statement. Um, what she was saying. Councilor Rothenberg. Sorry, just couldn't find my mute button. Well, I think that's great that you just said that you don't know, and I think you should try to find out. And I don't think you should try to find out with just a quick question fielded to the mayor's table. I think you should actually crunch some numbers and try to find out. And to Dr. Bonner's point, I also just want to say that whether it's out of district placements or contracted, it's still not meeting the needs in-house which is the most inclusive and most cost-effective way to do that. And if we want to have a special meeting on that and figure it out why that's true, I think we should. We just heard so much, so much public comment about the schools. I'm really waiting for this council to take an active interest in the finances. And I'll tell you, a lot of people in the audience today received an email from Jarrett today telling them it's too complicated and they don't understand it. And it's just not correct. I think. It's not that complicated, and we need to work on understanding it as counselors. Thank you. Uh, um, Councilor Rothman, I guess 40 years working in hospitals, they, we had tons of contract employees, and we I know how they work, and I was one for a while, too. So um, I think I, I'm aware of how contract employees work. You're not aware of whether they're more expensive or less expensive for our special education people. They're not ongoing. They don't have benefits. They're not ongoing they're expenses. No sorry. talking over each other. Um, I'm sorry, are we please. having a dialogue or a conversation or no? Um, it, it, if it's not okay to start talking over each other, so I would like for folks now to be recognized. And Councilor Rothenberg, um, you are recognized. Excellent. I am also finished. Thank you. Councilor Clemmer. A contract employee is has a contract. They're not a permanent employee, so it's different. They're not, you know, it's not an ongoing expense. They could work for three months or, uh, you know, school year or whatever. So it's not an ongoing expense like it is if you hire somebody and, you know, you expect them to work for you for 20, 30, 40 years. So it's very different. Are there other comments relevant to this issue? Councilor Moult. I have a question that's relevant to the, um, uh, to the supporting uh, letter from um, Matt Holloway, Director of Student Services, that I'd like to address to either the mayor or uh, Dr. Bonner. Um, in that memo, uh, Director Holloway identifies the uh, Unanticipated costs to be approximately $284,733 in the, the current fiscal year. The order tonight covers roughly $150,000 of that. The remaining $130,000, I take it from reading the memo, will come from perhaps Circuit Breaker Extraordinary Relief or other state and federal funding sources. Any remaining amounts would need to be a part of the annual local budget request. I, I guess my question is about that last sentence. Um, if uh, the, the uh, school department does not uh, receive a relevant state or federal funding to cover the remaining costs, which I assume have already been committed to, what is the plan for, for the remaining amounts? 
Would that be a question for Dr. Bonner? Or the mayor. Or the mayor. Um, so Dr. Bonner could better explain how Circuit Breaker uh, works, which I believe would, would cover um, the amounts, although it um, – how Dr. Bonner, you could do a better job of this than I can. Um, it is – you you get the previous year's circuit breaker in the current year so it's always behind a year i believe that's right yes and so we are uh, projecting that the circuit breaker for this year will will reach a certain threshold that will be able to um cover the remaining amounts in which um and these are projected amounts um so um it would cover additional amounts that may uh, occur. And so we already know in terms of the tuition, we're hoping again, Circuit Breaker will definitely uh, cover um, the remaining amounts. But indeed, if there is um, a need to, um, well, if, if there is a short, a shortfall, which we're not expecting, but if there is a shortfall, we would have to then re-look look at our operating budget and uh, transfer some line items to make sure that we uh, meet, meet our obligations. Yeah, so a follow-up, Dr. Barr, thank you for that explanation. So th these are costs that have been committed to, and you're confident that somehow NPS will cover those costs during the current fiscal year? Yes, and that, that's the, these costs that I'm showing you. We have about six months left of school, seven months left of school, and we don't know if we would uh, have any additional children moving into our system that may, again, require some um, um, additional funds. But right now, we are able to cover these expected costs through, um, through this request tonight and the circuit breaker. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve. Move, Move to approve. approve. Second. Second. Oh, I think uh, <laughs> Councillor Elkins. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to give the second to Councillor. Yeah. <laughs> Is there further discussion? Count, uh, Mayor, share. Can, can I just make one uh, further point that I actually asked Dr. Bonner about? I think it was this week. Um, Using the special ed stabilization fund doesn't impact our ability to go after the full amount of circuit breaker. So it, it wouldn't subtract from the circuit breaker amount. This would just be additional funding. So I just wanted to make sure that people understood that. Thank you. Um, before we vote, I would just like to say that I um, <clears throat> look forward to dialoguing further with, with my constituents. And I don't think that the math uh, and, and the budgeting and the financing is too difficult to understand. Um, whether of this item or, or budgeting in general. Um, and um, I think there are, we do have some disagreements uh, and uh, look forward to continued conversations. Uh, roll call, please, on approval. Sure. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. <coughs> Yes. And Counts Councillor Dobbs? Yes. And Councillor Elkins? Yes. That passes unanimously. Uh, brings us to ordinances not yet referred. 24.166, an ordinance relative to multi-way stop signs on Hatfield Street at Cook Avenue. And um, this is in first reading. And you may recall that we approved a temporary order for these uh, stop signs. So the stop signs are currently in place, and this is now an ordinance to make it permanent. And I believe we have Director Lascalia with us. Yes, good evening, Director. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. This is um, a, actually a really great improvement. Um, for the area and um, pleased to announce that uh, Fleston O'Neill has studied the temporary installation for us and determined that um, the signs are functioning as designed and that uh, the recommendation is that we make them permanent. Um, so the only wrinkle here is that um, we do have the clock ticking on this temporary installation. 
Um, it's good for 120 days from the council vote. Um, so we do need a, um, an approval on this if the council um, wishes um, at, by December 16th. Okay, December 16th, which would be ahead of our usual uh, schedule because our next Legislative Matters meeting is on the 9th, mm -hmm. and then our um, that meeting after that is December 19th, so we've, we're three days, three days off. Um, <clears throat> so we have a couple of options. We can um, waive referral to Legislative Matters and um, and give uh, have further discussion. Give you know have two weeks for um, any discussion and input, and then vote on mm -hmm. December fifth. Or we can schedule a special meeting of legislative matters uh, before December fifth. Or a quick council Elkins. Or a quick special council meeting following the regular legislative matters, just for this item. Right. Would be one other option. Right. Right. Uh, Councillor Moulton. Um, <coughs> refresh my memory. Was this when the temporary signs were put in place? Was that referred to uh, legislative matters at that time? I don't believe so. It's an order, so uh, orders are not required to be okay. um, referred to. Okay, so it hasn't been the legislative matters at all. I, I will say, in supportive of uh, Director Lascalia's. Um, recommendation that this be made permanent. Uh, first of all, thank you for your responsiveness on this, Director. I, I have not heard any uh, concerns expressed by uh, people who live in that area about any unintended consequences. Uh, as Director Lascaia has said, um, we've, we've heard uh, only uh, support for this, uh, and it's been a long time coming. So I. I, um, I, I guess I would, uh, I would uh, move to waive uh, the usual process of sending it out to legislative matters. So that, that that's a motion. That is second. Motion made by Councillor Moulton and seconded by Councillor Elkins to waive the requirement that we refer uh, ordin this ordinance to legislative matters. So in that timeline, uh, we would not vote tonight, but we would vote on December 5th, giving two weeks for members of the public to um, provide any input that they may have. Yep. Maybe the mayor is about to tell us we can't or something? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I just want to echo what Councillor Moulton said. We've um, only received positive feedback, and I agree this has been a long time coming. This, uh, this neighborhood has wanted um, and needed the stop sign for a long time, and um, they, it seems to be working really well, and they're, they're really happy with it. So, Director, we're, we're not seeing any significant, I know one of your concerns was that with the 10 to 1 ratio of traffic uh, on Hatfield Street versus Cook Avenue, that there may be uh, significant backups during certain times, and, and we're not seeing that. Yeah, I had two concerns. The first was traffic queuing during peak hours, and the second was um, tractor trailer movements or large truck movements. Um, if we had queuing on Hatfield Street and trucks were trying to make movements off of Cook Avenue, if we were going to end up with conflicts. And we're, we're not seeing uh, either of those two scenarios play out in a worst case um, manner. So we're seeing, you know, kind of worst case, we have sort of four or five cars stacking up on, um, uh, on Hatfield Street, but they're moving through quickly. Um, and we're just not seeing the truck conflicts um, that we were concerned might happen. So really everything's moving um, very easily uh, through the intersection. And you know, I think the warning barrels have really um, kind of notified people um, that there's a new installation. Um, I am going to have to remove those. Um, we're potentially expecting some snow next week, so you are going to have to pull those barrels. Um, but I think, you know, all things considered, this has been a really positive development, and we're just not seeing any bad impacts. Okay, thank you. Is there any other discussion um, on the question of, of whether of suspending the rules so we don't refer to legislative matters? 
Okay, seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Clamor. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. Councillor Dubbs. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Okay, that rule is suspended, and we will take this ordinance up at our next meeting on December 5th. It brings us to resolutions, and we have a resolution in second reading, 24.160, a resolution opposing expansion of the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School. So this um, was introduced and discussed two weeks ago, and there were some um, modifications made to the, in the meantime, based on feedback, um, some amendments. So. It's uh, as, uh, so one of the things that happened was that the school committee uh, voted to oppose this expansion in a letter to local, local legislature, le le legislators and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, at their November 14th <laughs> meeting. So we made a change to uh, indicate that. Um, <clears throat> and there were some minor changes to some of the headings and um, changes to the language uh, about the elimination of 21 positions and the correct percentage of, of increase in funding from the city over fiscal year 2024. Um, I believe that is, and just some other heading changes. So, um, discussion on this resolution, or would my fellow sponsors, I, actually we uh, can, should speak to it first, is the usual protocol. Um, so, Councillor Clemmer or Councillor Elkins, would you like to just uh, say any further words? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have too much to add from uh, when we introduced it, um, except for to say that um, we, uh, A, give us a little time to tweak, and I always will take the opportunity. Um, and um, and so we worked to. Um, there were a couple of questions raised. We worked to uh, answer those. Uh, we're in communication with uh, uh, Director Nardi, and uh, uh, with with those things, and uh, also coordinated with, um, I believe, um, uh, School Committee member at large uh, Aileen uh, Davis. The school Committee was working on uh, what passed through that body. Um, and 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 spoke with her to make sure that we were um, um, speaking with a, a unified voice, um, and also to make sure we got in here procedurally. What happened in school committee? Um, so um, so yes, I think um, we have a we are we say again and again and again to the state, uh, asking that this be fixed, asking. Uh, that we not continue to um, expand charter school seats at the expense of um, our uh, public schools. Uh, and so we're going to do it again. So, yeah, um, yeah, I don't have too much to add, but, um, you know, I think it's a really, it's an important resolution because, um, you know, from everything we've heard tonight from all the people that were here um, talking about the needs of the students charter schools take away a lot of money from our schools so the last thing we need to do is expand them and um in the resolution there's numbers of how much money we lose annually um because of these charter schools so um, i'm really happy to work on this and i appreciate all the input from um, everybody that helped us out with the numbers and um the other counselors and I would add about some of the numbers. There are updated statistics, um, but they haven't been certified by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, so we were advised not to use them. But um, you know, th these numbers have been spoken about in school committee meetings. So if certified, they they show a significant increase in special education services um, between October 2023 and June 2024, um, and high needs and and low income percentages. Um, so that that should be noted, the the impact. And um, other counselors have input. Councillor Rothenberg. 
Yeah, I'm just confused by the, the whereas clause that includes the number of positions and it just doesn't make sense to me because I don't think this mayor's intention is if we if we had a bunch of all the charter school money to give it right to the schools. So I'm confused about this direct link that's being drawn in that paragraph. Can you speak to why that paragraph is there? It doesn't it doesn't seem like it's something the state needs to be hearing about, and it just doesn't seem logical to me. I think the whole thing should be removed. Are there any of our sponsors like to speak to this? No. Okay. Um, I I disagree. I think that it's it's relevant, and I firmly agree that if we, uh, in fact, our previous resolution that that requested the amount of the charter school. Um, cost be reimbursed to us, that that money would absolutely go directly to the schools. Well, you think 100% would go to the schools. Do you want to ask the mayor? That's $3 million. No. Point of, point of order. Are we being called on? Um, Council Rothenberg, the, the, <laughs> you may, may pose a question, but the, the, a resolution is not the, um, the mayor's you know, this is not the mayor's, this is our resolution as a council. Well, that is my question. I mean, I just posed that question. I'm waiting for an answer. That was my original question that you jumped in on. But I'd like to know if $3 million was given to us, would that all go to the schools? That seems to be the only way that paragraph makes sense. That is your question to the mayor. Correct. Mayor Scherer, would you like to speak to this question? If there was no longer charter sending t tuition at all, would would that whatever would be retained by the schools would stay with the schools? Councillor Labarge, I like the change of language on this right now. Looking at it, and I had the other one with the language that was originally put on it. I agree with this a hundred percent. I think it's definitely a problem of losing our students going in to these Pioneer Valley rooms, period. I, 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 I just having a problem with this charter school, period. It's hurting us big time. We have to look at the money that we're losing here and the amount of students. And that's a bad sign here for our city. How many more are we going to start losing now? I've gotten calls from people from different wards saying that they will send their kids, their kids, to private schools. So I do have a question about that. If they're going to a private school, do we have to pay for that child or whatever going to that private school? Say if we have mayor, like Williston Academy, that's a private school, and we're hearing from people saying private school. And it's causing some concerns of people hearing that. So but I agree with this resolution 100%. I think something needs to be done here. So your question is about the, what are the financial implications when a child goes to a private school right versus a charter right school. and I think even some people are getting confused with that when you say a private school look at Deerfield Academy that's the expense is huge there also too if you look at private schools you say Williston for high school well this resolution is speaking to charter schools and the, the right and the impact and the financial impact is detailed in the resolution. Uh-huh. Councillor Clemmer. I understand that. Yeah. You good? Um, so when a kid goes to a charter school, the money that the state gives is attached to the kid. So if the kid doesn't go to the charter school and mm -hmm. goes to Northampton public schools, the money stays with the kid in the public school, right? So it's not like this you know, money that's just floating around, it's per student. Is that correct? 
I mean, so the money would go stay in the schools then. But if, you know, so if there's 10 <coughs> kids in charter schools and now they decide to go to the Northampton Public Schools, Northampton Public Schools would retain the money for those kids. But if five of them went to the public schools and then five went, left the state, you know, our area, then we'd only get paid for five of them. Right, and one one of the issues is that charter sending tuition is uh, it varies by school, mm -hmm. um, and it's significantly more than um, than the per student at uh, the Northampton Public Schools or at, at a district school. Um, to quickly answer your question, we don't pay private school tuition, um, but we. Um, the amount of students and declining student enrollment does impact our Chapter 70 funding. So it, there, is, there is an impact when a student goes to a private school, but it's not the same sort of um, direct financial impact that a charter uh, sending tuition would have. Is there any oh, direct follow response? Up. Go ahead. Well, yeah. Um, so the $3 million that we're losing to charter schools. I mean, we would get a, whatever portion of that back per kid, though. We would, it's not, I mean, all the charter schools would have to close down, and all those kids would have to go into North Carolina public schools for us to get $3 million from those schools. Right. So the the sending tuition is, is as I said, different than what, like, a, the student, um, the amount that's covered by a student if they stay in district. Mm -hmm. So if, and I don't know, is Dr. Bonner still on here? She's, I was just looking no. um, If the charter system sort of just like disappeared overnight, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that we would automatically get $3 million mm -hmm. back because it was dependent on the tuition per, for each mm -hmm. school. We would get whatever the students Right, they we would, would have gotten for those students if they were in Northampton Public School. Right, if they came back. Yeah. So, I mean, if if the system, let's say the system remains and there is still tuition, but it was fully reimbursed mm -hmm. over the course of a student's career at that charter school back to the district, mm -hmm. then that would be equal to the amount mm -hmm. to the three million as it is right now. Thank you. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken on this issue who would like to speak? Okay, then we'll go to Councillor Rothenberg. I'm just trying to ask the mayor for a clarification. When I asked her if she would give all the money to the schools, she said, whatever the schools retain, the schools will retain. And I'm just wondering if she could reword that or clarify or explain what she meant by that answer. I, I mean, I think I've already clarified it. So again, if they decide to suddenly reimburse the, the tuition entirely, 100% um, not in their reimbursement formula, because 100% in the reimbursement formula is not um, reimbursement for the entire time that, uh, or at 100% for all the years that a student would be at a charter school. Um, but if it were to be a full reimbursement, then that would go um, to the schools. Okay, so the answer is yes. You would give the school, and you wouldn't then subsidize or take out three million because, see, the other part, Councilor Jarrett, the point of order. Sorry, a point of order. Can I be recognized? Um, I'm sorry. There, a point of order is raised, and that uh, you know comes before a. Uh, it can be raised at any time by a person, Councilor Elkins. What is your point of order? Uh, we are off uh, the item on the agenda. This is about this resolution. If there's something directed about the language, uh, or some about the language of this resolution, it is not um, an inquisition of the mayor. I agree. Councilor okay, Rothenberg, could you listen please. Could I continue my thought, which is about the language? Yes. Thank you. So the 8.49 percent. It doesn't make sense because which what, what you could do is you could say, I got a hundred million dollar per grant, okay? And so I'm gonna pay a dollar out of city money. Next year, the hundred million dollar per grant is gone, so I have to put in a hundred million dollars. But you know what, I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna put in 50 million. But good news schools, you got increased from one dollar to 50 million, which is the biggest increase you've ever had. That's how you get to an 8.49% number. 
by saying that when the schools were being subsidized in other ways, and you paid for city services with money that should have been school money, when that money runs out and you don't refund the schools entirely, you call it an increase of 8.49%. What you actually did was an increase of 3.7% over school expenditures for that year, 3.7%. And you're calling it 849 and you're asking us to sign off on that number, which has no relevance to the state, which is only relevant to your campaign. And it really inspires me to want to lodge a charter objection because it's just nonsense that should not be in this resolution. Councilor Moulton. Uh, I don't regard it as nonsense. I look at the, the fiscal year, the current fiscal year budget of $40,970,985, and that's not including the money that we just approved tonight. And I compare that to the last fiscal year's school budget of 37, 765, 747. Those are real numbers. And you know what? The difference is 8.49%. That is an accurate number. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at total school spending. Sorry, Council Rothenberg, you aren't recognized. No, I'm not recognized, but I lodge a charter objection. You'll have to reschedule this vote. That's, that's, that's it. All debate shall cease. <laughs> Okay, we move on to the Northampton Reparation Study Commission. Request for extension of October 5th, 2024 deadline for submitting final report with recommendations to mayor and city council. Uh, the Northampton Reparation Study Commission chair uh, requests an extension of this deadline for five months from October 5th, 2024 to March 6th, 2025. And I would recognize uh, the chair who's here today, Usman Power Green. Welcome. Yes. Is the green light? Is the green light on? Wait. Is the green light on? No, it's out here. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, really, the. <coughs> What's listed there is the uh, the request, and so I guess I'm here with some other commissioners uh, to answer any questions or to uh, find out more about the request. Great, thank you. Um, so, would the as I understand, the commission would simply like more time to submit its report, um, yeah. it, both its preliminary report and which, as we discussed, I'm planning on putting on the agenda for December 5th and then for the final report, which would need to be submitted by March 6th. Yeah, I mean, as all you can imagine, we could spend a lot more time working on this, but um, we're, our goal is to try to get as far as we can and, and, and then move on uh, past studying and pass it on to, to all of you. Great, thank you. Any questions oh. for the chair? No. Okay, I'd entertain a motion to uh, to approve the extension. Motion to approve, second it. Okay, motion made by Councillor Clemmer and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call please on approving the extension to March 6th, 2025. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Of course. Councillor Dubbs. Uh, Councillor Dubs, are you able to unmute? Yeah, um, sorry about that. My, my internet was bad for a second. Uh, okay. I had to uh, sign back in. Uh, what's your vote? Um, I'm sorry, can you tell me what the vote is? Again? Yes, absolutely. So it's a vote to. It's a vote to give the Northampton Reparation Study Commission an extension um, to March 6th, 2025. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Councilor Elkins. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. And Councilor Clemmer. Yes. Okay, that vote passes. And thank you so much for coming in. And we look forward to the presentation in two weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. So that's all that's on our agenda. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Motion made. Uh, did you have a question, Councillor Dubs? Oh, you were second. Okay, sorry. Uh, motion made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Elkins to adjourn. A roll call, please, on adjournment. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. Councillor Dubs. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, we are adjourned.